Hello, greetings, and welcome to episode two of The Connector. Our goal again with this podcast series is to connect you with the people who are building and using Azuqua each and every day. I'm your host, Dave Darrington, Director of User Enablement here at Azuqua, and today we're talking with Drew Hall. Drew is one of our solution developers and a super critical person involved with helping our customers get the max benefit out of Azuqua. Drew, welcome. Thanks, Dave. So, Drew, tell me about yourself. For instance, your background and what eventually brought you to Azuqua. So I'm Drew and 27 and I was originally a CS major and, you know, I'm a technology enthusiast, kind of how I ended up applying to this place. And yeah, I have a lovely girlfriend and her name's Sherilyn and dog named Misty. She's a Pomeranian, great dog. And this is actually my first job out of school. So I was lucky to land myself here, actually, because, you know, this is you know, a great place, great tool. And I think we'll talk about that in a little bit. But yeah, really happy to be here. Um, and uh I am, originally I was a customer success engineer and I have recently in the last few months moved over to solutions developer and yeah, so here we are. Cool. Okay. Tell me a little bit about, you came on board with Azuqua. How long have you been here now? Uh, a year and a year and a half next month. Year and a half. Fantastic. Well, half anniversary. You know, congrats. <laughs> um, okay. So tell me a little bit about your two roles then. What, what I'm interested about first, before we get into the donut bot, which is what we're here to talk about today. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about what you used to do as a customer support engineer and now in your new role as a solutions developer. How do they help our customers? Sure. Yeah. So originally as a CSE, you know, I, I was there to assist the customer with their technical product issues, their questions and kind of educating, which is, you know, a little bit of your role now. You're taking that component. But so originally as a, a customer success engineer, customer support engineer, I was just assisting customers with their technical product questions their issues and location, which is kind of like your role now, or that, at least that component. And, you know, it could range from anything from, is there a bug in one of our connectors? Connector being, you know, Slack, Gmail, Twitter, et cetera, Salesforce, those types of, you know, the connections. Mm -hmm. um, if there's a bug in there, I could go in and, and, you know, determine and look in the code and see if there's a bug there or if it's user error and help educate the customer if that was the case, um, stuff along those lines. And then, that, that's basically the, the CSE role. And then the solutions developer role now is, is kind of like the evolution a little bit, I would say. So one, I, I now know the product pretty well. I know it in and out. I know kind of the code base and, and, and understand use cases and what drives value for a lot of our customers. So what I can do now is take all that wealth of information and effectively build up to be, you know, deliver these kind of solutions, either packaged or you know, one off for individual customers if that's how they need it. But that's ultimately kind of the evolution into this solutions development role. Great. Okay, that sounds good. So so now instead of being reactive to problems, you're now getting more into help me understand, okay, I'll help you extrude out and create a solution, or even as adjacent to doing that, you'd be doing a little education. Yeah, it's a great way to put it. Great. Yeah. We're all we're all in on education. Everybody teaches yeah. here. Um let me ask you a third question before we get into some, some deeper ones. So you came to Azuqua about a year and a half ago. Tell me what excites you most about this product. What is the coolest thing that you've seen? What, what really helps you wake up every day and go, hey, I'm looking forward to coming into work because I want to tear into some new problems. What gets you most excited about Azuqua? Gosh. Well, one, I would say the people and the culture. I like I like coming to work and we have a great office and a great mm -hmm. view. So that's, you know, one great component. Um, and everyone, you know, is willing to help and help you learn. Uh, so that's that's good. But uh, ultimately, the best part is the platform. The platform is it's powerful. It it gosh, the platform, it, it's yeah, it's so powerful and has such a wide range of, of possibilities things that we haven't even considered yet. You know, it's, um, you know, really, I think what I'm interested in is seeing kind of where our customers can do when they come up with these like clever solutions themselves, you know. So between, you know, us as Azuqua developing and thinking about these solutions and then coming together with some customers. Because I've had this experience before where, um, you know, you just get to get on a call with one of our common customers, especially back when I was doing uh, the support work um, you know, just kind of, you know, having a back and forth and having a conversation about, oh, well, you know, I think that this will really work really well for, 
uh, Zuko. And if you implement the solution like this, and then some of our power users will respond like, well, what, what about this? You know, they, they input their ideas. And it's like kind of that, uh, you know, co-interaction, cooperative interaction. Just like, I, I love developing solutions with people like that. So that, that's really interesting. Um, but in addition to that, yeah, the power, the tool is really powerful and has a really wide breadth of possibilities too, right? I think one, we can do the really, really complex stuff where we can have tons of logic. You have tons of Azuka functions is what we call them. But you mm-hmm. can think about functions as, uh, you know, kind of think like JavaScript or, you know, basic code. You can have a lot of complex functions or you can have it reduced down to like very simple, like an email comes in, like you mentioned earlier, and it just forwards to another address. And that would mm-hmm. be like a two card solution. So there's that really wide breadth of, of possibility for when what what this tool can do so So you can do really simple things but in contrast you can do very elegant very complex solutions and workflows to it Mm -hmm. so the it's kind of like i've said in previous podcasts and in in my documentation it's kind of like having a a pile of legos where you can do anything and you can make anything happen and now it's up to your imagination and, and I think what you're saying is that you really enjoy working with customers that are trying to solve these problems and co-solving those problems. And, and therein lies the fun, the excitement. Yep. And also, I kind of lost like building solutions, you know, just think about what else can our platform do. So, yeah, that's, that's a good way to put it. That's great. Agreed. All right. Let me, let me um, ask you another question here. So the next question I have is, so, again, customers have all kinds of challenges that they're experiencing. And I used to be one of those customers, and I said, in my case, I wanted to connect an S3 bucket, um, put things in it automatically, and have the solution, right? My solution was all my data ended up in, at that time, I was a Gainsight employee, so I wanted my data to be in Gainsight. Really easy. I was super excited about it. Tell me a little bit about the common kinds of things that you work with as a solutions developer on a daily basis. Yeah, that's a good question. So the product is potentially complex right like we kind of just discussed that that you can really build very complex solutions and so it kind of requires a little bit of a technical knowledge um, I'd, I'd say if you have a little bit of coding experience you're pretty well off you don't have to be you know deep or anything you can just you know some basics but mm-hmm. uh, a lot of type handling so objects lists um, numbers etc but then you also have a Zuqua kind of proprietary types such as flow right? There's a Mm -hmm. flow. You can call a flow. And what that is is actually just a number because it's an idea of that flow. But it's interesting because that's just a kind of, you know, it's an additional type. So it goes along those lines of coding and stuff like that. So you're saying I could call a flow. Again, flow is shorthand for workflow in Azuqua. And I could have a child flow. So I could have my primary and I could say I built my own kind of function in a separate flow. And connect that right in. Mm -hmm. So you have this construction set. Yep, precisely. Amazing. Also, Azuqua is built on a functional programming model as opposed to an imperative programming model, which is which is important. And I've seen a lot of customers kind of trip up on this. And uh, for those of you that may not be familiar, functional is kind of one way. It just goes goes forward. And where imperative kind of loops and for loops, while loops, which our product doesn't technically inherently do it's something that you can finagle and it's part of the power of the tool you can actually make that happen but it's not intuitive to get there and the users can trip up on that because i think functional is a little bit of a a newer it's not newer but it's it's being more widely adopted today as opposed to you know in the past few years i think sure another challenge is azuqua kind of given all of that context that we just kind of talked about i think azuqua in and of itself is kind of its own proprietary language which is which is interesting. You can, you know, I would say I myself am uh, proficient in Azuqua's language, right? Which is just kind of getting to understand those those programming concepts and applying it into our, our UI drag and drop model. And then additional things like that flow type, if you will. You're saying it's a proprietary thing. It's kind of like a visual programming language. And I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that you played with things like Scratch before. Not. My daughter has a class after school that she goes and learns how to program in Scratch. And Scratch is a visual programming language, kind of designed for kids, but not really. It's really elegant. But when I saw a flow for the first time and I saw Zuko for the first time, I go, this is like Scratch. This <laughs> is a visual environment. And I don't need to be bothered with all the things like I used to be 
a Python and SQL programmer, and they're really hard because you can't intuitively see stuff. So I think what you're telling me is that it's a proprietary language and a visual language, and it makes it easier for people to approach. Yeah, correct. Excellent. All right. Any other common challenges that you see customers have that, like, our audience that's listening in might get super excited about the things we're going to talk about today? No, not off the top of my head. Okay. All right. Let's get into two. Now, we're building up to the Donut Bot. Um, one other question I have prior to getting into that is, what are the things you use Azuqua for personally? Meaning, hey, I'm not necessarily solving a customer problem. Have you ever implemented something with Azuqua that's more like out of curiosity or something that is a process that helps your day to day? Yeah, that's a really good question. And in fact, the whole company actually, it's the term dog food, I believe. The uh, dog food. Eat support. your own dog food. Yeah. Or more elegant term is drink your own champagne. <laughs> I like that. I've never <laughs> heard that one. I like that. Um, yeah, that I, the whole company actually uses the product for a lot of processes. And myself, especially as a customer support engineer, when I was doing that, I leveraged, and we use Zendesk internally, mm -hmm. um, especially for you customers who have interacted with support, you would already know that. But what's what's really cool is that I had so many integrations with Slack. I had all a ton of notifications. We have new tickets come in. I had a channel for that. When we had ticket updates come in, I had a channel for that. And it was organized in such a way that I, you know, I was able to prioritize, okay, this is an update on a ticket. So, you know, I don't need to necessarily look at that one that, that quick because mm -hmm. they've already been, I've already been working with them. Um, but if a new ticket comes in, it kind of notifies me in Slack and kind of gives me that information that I need to kind of quickly go in and assess like, oh, or what customer it's from, you know, that's a really, you know, important customer, something along those lines. So that was a really common one that we still use today, actually. We also have a lot, actually, Slack is a really big one like, off the top of my head. Like, for example, we have Slack notifications for development, for shipping, for product health even like if we have an issue with the product we have our slack get pinged all over the place uh, for everyone to get quick visibility into that there's a lot of things where we do we have something we have a ui component that i mm -hmm. that is still in its like beta phase it's called flow pages um, some customers may or may not be familiar with this but which is another powerful component of our tool by the way so there, what we can do, it's a lot of internal processes are handled by, so for example, sometimes we need to go assess like user customer flows and like that are either, you know, doing a lot of excessive work or there's maybe some type of problem. Um, and so what we do is we have the engineers that encounter these problems. We actually have like flow page, which is effectively in this scenario, a form. And mm -hmm. then we submit a form. And then it logs, you know, these details to a table. And then, you know, we can hook that up to email, Slack, all these, you know, all our connections, stuff like that. So that's a big use case for us internally is, is using this form flow page functionality. And it's just, it's a quick ingestion point, easy for us to spin up. You know, it takes us 10 minutes to build this form and it's hook up a flow. And then we have a new process available with a lot of visibility for the whole company. That's really cool. And I'm relatively new here. I've been at the time of this recording, I've been about three weeks in, but I'm already seeing all of these interconnection points from different things and how much it helps us all. Because, you know, you simply have a process that shows you an MPS score or some other thing. And now I'm immediately seeing how I can use our own product to help me be reactive and help me be proactive. Right. Okay. So here's my big question. So today somebody showed me over the past couple of weeks, something called the donut bot, right? And I actually saw somebody get what we call it internally donutted. I think it's a really interesting use case. Now, this is a story that we're telling, and this is an Azuqua culture story. What I want to do is just basically ask you what this is all about, and then we're going to do a show me. We're going to share the computer, we're going to share our screen, and we're going to go in here. What I would like to know is what this is, what the donut bot is, what's the value to us as an organization and then I'd like you to show me how it works. So at this point, what I'm going to do is start a little video. I'm going to get, let you have control of it. You can talk through it, and we'll have fun. Cool. So we're now ready to do a demo. So Drew, again, why don't we go ahead, and I would like you to walk through the whole solution. And the easiest way to do this and to back into this is just start by talking about the donut bot. What is it? What was asked of you when you created this thing. And then the piezo resistance, the big reason why we're here is 
I want you to show me, show our audience how you did this, okay? So you have the floor, so go ahead and uh, show us and show our audience what's going on. Yeah, so originally uh, this was, excuse me, originally this was a kind of a loose process. When I started at Azuko, this was already a thing, and it was just kind of a loose security, fun culture thing, kind of like you explained earlier. Um, and what it was is, you know, someone leaves their computer open, you get donated, and the only thing that, that kind of happened was the user, the employee going up to the other employee who's getting donated, they would just type in some funny comment, haha, I'm bringing in donuts tomorrow, or something like that, and that was kind of it. And it was just the, the accountability was like, it was in the general channel for Slack, so everyone in the company could see it, and you were just kind of accountable from that perspective. People just held it in their minds. Um, and what we were seeing was that, you know, people weren't being held accountable and people were forgetting if the list would get too long. It was like, oh, well, do we have a list? Does anyone know who was next up on donating? Because I, you know, some people would use that as an excuse. Like, well, I'm not going to bring in donuts tomorrow because the list is super long and I don't know who's on the list before me. And so I wasn't, you know, I, I just took it upon myself to develop a solution because I, I had the idea. I was like, oh, well, what happens Ultimately, it was, well, okay, we need to log this into a table or a mm -hmm. database um, so that we have that list of users. Um, and to me, it was, it was ultimately really clear that, okay, well, let's build some flows uh, that handle this. And it only took three flows and oh, wow. well, I think one table. And it's actually a pretty simple solution. And then a, a Slack app um, for those of you familiar with that, um, which is also very easy to set up. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so now this implementing this solution, it's more rigid and accessible to everybody because what we can do, there's two, two Slack commands. Uh, one is donut, which adds you to the <laughs> list. And then the other one is slash donut queue. Um, and that just reports the list to the channel. So everybody can just you know, see it uh, whenever they want. So, so again, the idea here is we wanted to try to invoke a little bit better enterprise security through a fun culture thing. And so that anybody, if you leave your computer open, totally accessible to the world and everybody, somebody can come in and just simply type donut slash donut in Slack channel. And then everybody knows, oh, I left my computer open. Yep. So this is like a little chagrin where you go, okay, well, I'm not going to do that again. We have a really good way to say, okay, I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want to have to bring in donuts. I'm going to lock my computer. And now we've solved a major enterprise security vulnerability simply by shame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but also fun. But and also fun. It, you know, during the winter months, it's really good because it bulks up all the employees. <laughs> and, you know. <laughs> so why don't you, why don't you show me visually, show the audience visually all the pieces of this, particularly like getting into the flow and like how all this works. Yeah. So uh, like I said, there is there's a, just a few components to this. One is the Slack app. App. Um, and right here we're looking at it and I actually titled it Homer as you can see um, you have the little Homer as our hopefully we don't get copyright infringement or trademark <laughs> infringement here um, but uh, yeah so and, it's, and this is a little fun you know just fun guy um, and so you see here's our two uh, commands here from the app perspective mm -hmm. um, and all this does all these these apps do is it just invokes um, a webhook okay uh, and a webhook in the Azuka context is um, a flow that begins with an API endpoint. So ultimately, an API endpoint monitor on the flow, which just it just listens for you know requests that come in and whatever it takes whatever data uh, that was sent from the request. So in this right. scenario, we just do the slash donut in Slack. It hits this endpoint and then it will pass whatever data that we told it to pass. Okay. Um, and so that's basically it. And then also additionally, we have, the, like I mentioned, the donut queue, which just reports the queue to the general chat. And that's it for the Slack bot. Um, so that was pretty easy to create. And if you're interested in creating your own Slack bot, it's not overwhelming. Yeah. And I don't want to go through this here just because if we went to the basic info, we have some credentials. So, but yeah, it's it's pretty simple process. It, you know, maybe take you 20 minutes if you're not familiar or something along those lines. Absolutely. Um, and then here are the three flows. And this is the donut bot controller. Uh, this just controls what goes on. You know, it's a controller function, if you will. Um, this is the reporter 
Uh, so this is for either endpoint. So this is a slash donut. This is a slash donut queue. Well, okay. Donut queue. Yes, thank you. And then this here is the donut queue accumulator. So ultimately, this is another function, if you will, that uh, builds the table and builds it nicely for Slack. So it shows up nicely. Excellent. Basically formats that table for us. Excellent. And so here's the logic. Now, what are we looking at here? This is the primary controller yep. that so does is, the, the when I do, slash donut somebody. This is the logic behind it? Yep, correct. So this is the listener on slash donut command. So it just hits the endpoint. And what's uh, so this is a little bit, this is specific to the Slack API. Can you zoom in a little bit oh, so yeah, that we yeah. can see these good, better? Good, and then we'll good, zoom good. out to see the whole, the big picture. Yeah, there we go. I think that's good. Okay. So step through it. So here is the API endpoint, and that's that. Uh, the thing that you were talking about just a moment ago. Yeah, this is the URL that, that the Slack command hits. So I'll show you right here. This is where you actually get the URL. Um, so this is our invoke URL right here. And this is what we grab to put in this input here. So this is where you grab that from the flow, put this here, and then when you call slash donut, it will hit this flow and invoke okay. it. And so what this is here is this is a, a close that just says, hey, Slack, we got your message. Um, and this, the body here is a kind of the API, proprietary to the Slack API. But this just says, you'll see when we do it. But to the person who does Slack donut, it'll give you a command or a response that only you see that doesn't go out to the whole team that just says, you've been added to the queue to let you know that, um, that it was successful. And then here we get the... Excuse me. Uh, so here is the date now. So this just gets the time of when we're invoking it. And then uh, this just translates that to, um, gosh, what is this? This is a. Uh, Looks like an ISO format that Slack is going to read. Yeah, no. Well, we actually logged this to the table, I believe. Okay. But it's a, forget the name of the format. It's okay. uh, like the Linux time. Um, and then here we just get all of the data from the body of the request. So for example, channel ID being this being general, channel name, main general, uh, user ID, the person that's getting donated or invoking the command, uh, the command name, text, etc. Okay. And then this gets the user details from the user ID. And then this allows... And that's pulling that out of Slack. So yeah, we so know this, who this is. Yes. So okay, this is our, in our Slack connector. Yep. Excellent. And so... Yep, and then what we do here is basically log all these details to the table because we need all of that information. Um, Ooh, now I see a, a more complex uh, if else card. This is pretty cool to show. Yeah, and so if else, this is you think of it like branch or you know very very typical if else logic encoding. Um, but what you'll see here is there's a create row and an update row. So ultimately, what this is is if you're a user that's been bad and you get donated multiple times we need to increment that count right so you see if we create a row donut count here is just one so that's the first time offender yep. exactly exactly <laughs> oh and what i forgot to show you is the table let's i'm gonna go back to that real quick sorry about that so the table that just logs the queue of people um so no uh, for the audience here if you haven't used tables before this is a feature of azuqua that allows us to construct an a, a table that's quickly accessible to anything that you would do in a Zook while connecting the flows, et cetera, correct? Correct, correct. Um, yeah, I thought that was a good thing to show because that's what uh, where this is being written to. Okay, um, that makes sense now. And if, if uh, excuse me, let's go back real quick, and you'll see that some users do have more than one, right? So we need to increment that count. Good. Yeah, and so what we're doing here is we're, either going to create a row if the, so actually, let me back up another little bit. Um, so what we do is we take that user and we search the table. If that employee's name, if it exists in the table, then it returns this data. And so what we're doing here is in this if else is we're doing a check if this row ID, we'll go on x-ray. So if the row ID coming from there is, is equal to an empty string, which ultimately means they do not exist in the table, then we create a row. Otherwise, we are going to increment their donut count by one and then update their donut count and the recent message that was added. So that just handles, you know, either basically 
multiple donuts for a user. Um, and then what we do here is here is where we uh, actually perform the accumulation of, of the, the table and then post it to Slack. So okay. this is just formatting it for Slack. Um, and then we trim it because it just we just want to get rid of some of the extra white space there. And then what we do here is this is, since we don't actually have this is actually a cool component of, of our tool where if we don't have a supported connection uh, or sorry, excuse me, action for that connector. For example, mm -hmm. Slack, we don't have like this. I think we do now, but at the time of designing this, we didn't have like a, a bot kind of post by bot. And so okay. what's cool about this is you can actually do your own custom HTTP requests. And that's what we did here. Um, and so what this does is this is actually posts that table to general chat which ultimately lets everyone know, hey, you've been donated. Amazing. Yep. So that's the that's the primary workhorse of this. Again, there's a lot of steps in this, but if you read it left to right, it's pretty straightforward. These are each pretty simple. The only thing that's a little bit more advanced would be the if-else if you haven't seen those kind of things. But if you've had some exposure to programming concepts before, it's not onerous or difficult at all. Yeah. So again, we've got a couple other things in there that you can show me. And then what I really like to do is, Walk through those, and then can we see a demo of this in action? Absolutely. Great. Okay, so in those two other components, uh, this is the donut queue uh, endpoint, very similarly designed. Instead of adding people to the table, uh, it's actually really the same logic. We just took mm -hmm. out the, the table stuff um, where we just search. We do the accumulation to build that nice formatted for Slack table, um, and then we just post it. Same thing here. So that's just a reporter. And then this is the uh, formatter. It's a reduce that, uh, well, excuse me, it's a child flow that gets used. We use a list reduce function in order to do this. So what ultimately what we do is for every user, uh, we get their data from the table and then we kind of just keep compiling um, each row in the table. And, and that's what a list reduce function does is it yeah. procedurally goes through everything and does and constructs exactly what you need for output? Correct. So yes, thank you for clearing up. Yeah, so... That's just the reduce functionality there. Super cool. Yeah. Um, and what's here, this is actually, if else here, it's kind of neat. All I did was if the, if you're the top of the list, effectively, we bold you. Get you a little, <laughs> little bit more visibility that you're on the top and you owe the next donut. Excellent. And that's really all the components uh, to this thing. So now we can actually demo this for you. Cool. I'm excited about this. So uh, let's go ahead. How are we going to demo this? So I think we're going to have to donate you, Dave. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you want me to log myself into Slack? Yep. I'm glad this doesn't count because I've been really good so far. <laughs> you know, I think I even put a note in there in general so that our uh, fellow employees know that this is a test and you're not going to be liable. Okay. So let me get my screen up here. And let's just go to, where do we want to go? Uh, general chat. Well, actually, if you want, we can do, what's interesting is you can donate from any channel, and it will log, it's always going to log to general. Okay, so I'm going to bring this up on the screen. You can see everything that I have. So we're kind of transparent here. Okay, do you have control? Yeah, so what we're going to do here is just... Uh, slash donut and you'll see that these uh, two commands immediately pop up um, one is to add the, to the queue and then one's to report the queue uh, and I'm, we're just going to add dave to the queue because this is his slack and then we actually have to add a message uh, here we go and it kicks off you've been added to the donut queue that's that ethereal <laughs> uh, only visible to you and then we have to wait for these flows to process momentarily so do we want to kick them off or are they going to go automatically so oh, we can see the history uh yeah we'll we'll click the flow history but i'm waiting for the response here in general okay how long does it usually take it's usually pretty quick um sometimes it can run into like an error and then it doesn't report so again, what you're looking at, Drew, here is you're checking the flow history to see when it's what it's executed, when the last time it ran. 
And so we see a 153, which is just now, that's the donut that I just did, which added you to the queue. And you can see it uh, created a row for Dave. Oh, okay. Because fortunately, you have not been donated yet. Uh, and then here we go all the way across. And no. Huh. I see. It says uh, Dave has been donated. Great. <laughs> and then you can see how it also appends the uh, the testing, the message as well to the end there. So if you want to let people know that there's a message. And here we go. We see in Slack that Dave has been donated. Here's his uh, the, the message that I added right after the command. And it also additionally pastes that new table in there. And you can see you have been added just to the uh, bottom of the list, Dave. <laughs> and we have a few people, unfortunately, that still owe their debts. Um, so these people aren't great Lannisters, are they? <laughs> All right. I, I, you know, props for the Game of Thrones saying <laughs> there. I love it. And, well, this uh, is great. Yeah. And so what I want to do now is, let's see, we'll just talk to yourself. And this is just going to kind of demonstrate the donut queue. And then also you can do it from a different uh, channel. And so this is also going to report it. And what we'll see is an additional list. It's going to look basically just like the one we saw. Um, processing donut queue. And then when we go back into general, you see the current donut queue is the following. We got a cool little donut emojis. And then our current queue. And Very as good. you see here, uh, yeah, the, the text is a little different, but nothing too important. You know, Dave's been donated. Donut queue is now as follows. And then this one is... The current donut queue. So we know what we invoked. It was, you know, people know that, oh, someone didn't get donated when we say the queue. All right. Excellent. Okay, let's close that screen out and then we're going to wrap up. Is there anything else you want to show me here, Drew? You know, I think that's, that's about it, Dave. Okay. Let me wrap this up by saying I've been in my career a former enterprise security project manager. So why I really wanted to have you on the show, Drew, is that this is something, while it's not one of the primary use cases that a lot of our listeners and customers would be accustomed to, this is one of those cases where, again, creativity, and this is why I, I really commend you for doing a great job on this and taking the initiative and saying, I'm going to use Azuqua to do something not only practical, but also fun, because this solves a major problem. As Having been from a security background, I know for a fact that one of the biggest liabilities to security is human beings mm -hmm. because I could get lazy. I can walk away from my computer for a minute. And, you know, while it's a little, it's kind of embarrassing when you get donated. Now I've been donated officially. I know it's a test. <laughs> it's embarrassing. But that embarrassment, that, that personal connect makes me really think about and this is workflow. This really is workflow, even though it's not the traditional kind of thing. It makes me think about security from a daily basis. So I think this is really cool. And let's just say, you know, from an enterprise security basis, this is just a case where if you keep your laptop unlocked, now we have this whole automated workflow. Perhaps this wouldn't scale to a big level, but yeah. this could be something that you could use as well. So the best part about this, we get donuts. Right? That's right. That's right. Okay. All right. Drew, we're going to wrap this up. Uh, I want to thank you once again for your time and showing us something not only practical, but something fun and something that's kind of like a Lego kit. You built it. You, you ate your own dog food here, drank your own champagne. This is pretty awesome. And, you know, for my former role, this is also a sense of childlike joy, something <laughs> novel and unique. So I really dig it. Okay. With that, if you want to learn more, please, again, visit our website at Uh For a demo, just click request a trial. If you want to learn more, you want to actually get in and try to do some of these things for yourself. Really would love you to have that opportunity. And again, Drew, thanks for sharing your donut bot to our audience. Thanks for joining us and get out there and make some connections. <laughs>